Good morning and welcome to the services of the Farmington Church of Christ uh, video series. Uh, since we can't meet together as we would like to, uh, we are doing this and hopefully all the members and those uh, watching out there will uh, be able to worship together and uh, would like to tell you the order of our services this morning. After I say prayer, we will have uh, uh, some singing, and hopefully you'll join in your home in this. And then we will have a communion service, and then after that, Brother Mike will be uh, bringing a lesson. So if you will, at this time, uh, bow with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you for watching over us, this congregation, this country, as we go through this uh, trying time. And Father, we know that uh, you have this whole world in your hands and we, we submit to your will. Father, we pray that you will be with the sick of our number, uh, especially Leela, Leela Scroggins at this time and other members that we may not know of, and Father, help us all to, uh, to love one another, to put you first, and uh, our brothers and sisters ahead of ourselves. Father, we pray that uh, as we go through these times that we will seek out ways to help one another. Father, we are, we are so thankful for those who are putting their lives online to minister to those who are deathly sick. And Father, we, uh, we are so thankful for them. Help us to show our, our love to them in some way, form, or fashion. Father, be with us this morning as we uh, sing these songs of praise. May they be from our heart. And the message we hear this morning, Father, we pray that uh, Brother Mike will bring this lesson in a way that we can understand and apply it to our lives. Father, be with us and all who are uh, tuning in on this series this morning. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
The past several Sundays, we've stood before you and explained the memorial that we're about to partake of. Jesus instituted this memorial during the Passover meal, something the Israelites partook of to remember their deliverance from bondage from the Egyptians and the slavery that they were enduring. Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, eat it, and when you eat it, remember me. Then he took the cup and gave it a blessing and drank the cup and said, drink this cup and remember me, remember the blood that I shed for your sins. So we do take this memorial to remember the pain, the suffering, the anguish, the humiliation that our Savior went through as he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And I think not only do we use this time to remember uh, Jesus and the suffering that he did on our behalf, but I think we also uh, use this time as a teaching tool. You know, I'm fortunate to be able to worship with family. Uh, and there's not very many Sundays that go by that I don't have a, a grandchild uh, sitting in the pew with me. And that's such a blessing. And so as I partake this memorial and watch those children, um, and I hear them ask, can I have one? Can I have a, can I have a juice? And so even at a young age, I think it's a good time to start teaching our children the purpose of the memorial. Why are we doing what we're doing? And they're never too young to learn and, and teach them uh, about this sacrifice that was made on behalf of sin. As we partake this memorial, uh, let us not only remember Jesus and the suffering that he did, but also let us remember the empty tomb, the power that Jesus had over death, and let us rejoice in that. But more importantly, let us teach our children the importance of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this bread. We pray that you will bless this bread as we partake of it, that we might remember Jesus, the pain, the suffering, the anguish that he bore on a cruel, cruel Roman cross. Father, I pray that as we partake of this, we might look back uh, to that cross. Father, I pray that we might also look forward, uh, look forward to the time when we can live in your paradise uh, for eternity. And Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together as we bless the cup. Father, we give you thanks for Jesus, for the blood that he shed that cleanses us from all of our transgressions, our sins and our iniquities. Father, we pray that as we partake of this, we might uh, certainly remember the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. Father, I pray that we would, that we would partake of this in a manner that's pleasing to you and Father, I pray that we would teach our children and our children's children uh, about this memorial that we're partaking of. And that as we do this, that we might, uh, that we might train them uh, in your word. Father, I pray that, that as we partake of this, that you would bless us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our giving is something that we're commanded to do. Uh, we're told that we should lay by as we've been prospered uh, and that we should do this weekly. And so while we're not meeting together, um, you might find it, some of you, maybe a little bit more difficult uh, to make your contribution. Uh, but we've tried to make uh, the proper arrangements to make that a little bit stress-free for you. So you can drop your contribution by the building. 
uh, during the office hours that are published in the bulletin. You can mail your check to our post office box. Again, you can find that address in our bulletin. Uh, you can use the, the donate uh, tab at the bottom of the screen uh, on our church website and pay by debit card, credit card, uh, PayPal account. Uh, you can do that as well. We pray that, uh, that you've thought about your contribution and that you've thought about uh, the work that's being done here at Farmington and that that work would be blessed uh, through the monies collected uh, and that your elders would, uh, would see to that uh, in proper fashion. Let's pray as we are about to give. Father, you've blessed us in so many ways. You've given us uh, so many things to be thankful for. You've blessed us beyond measure. Father, thank you for our homes. Thank you for the food that we eat. Thank you for the clothes on our backs. Father, help us not to take these things for granted, but to give you the praise and glory for all that we have, and that, and that we have a true understanding that all good things come from you, and apart from you, we are nothing. Father, I pray that as we give this morning, that we would give uh, with a cheerful heart. I pray that we've thought about our giving and that we would give really, Father, beyond what we think we're capable of and that we would give uh, in faith and that we would give joyously and that we would give in a manner that's pleasing unto you. Father, we pray for our elders as they distribute these funds. We pray for wisdom and guidance and we pray that these funds might be used to further uh, your word not only in our community but throughout the world and father it's in jesus name that we ask these blessings and favors and amen morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. We appreciate you all joining us via the internet and YouTube or through our Facebook page. Uh, difficult times and I'm proud that churches are able to use the tremendous innovations that we have. Um, and there's new innovations coming down the pipelines and whether if it's the media, the way churches operate, uh, whether it's in medicine, uh, God is good. God has filled us with this wisdom and this knowledge, and, and I am so thankful for it. In your Bible, what we've been talking about is on our walls, we have two banners, and we have a theme every year. Last year, it was blessed to bless. This year, it is in Farmington as it is in heaven. That's a tall order. The Lord is basically asking children of God to be ambassadors of His before a world that is being drawn to Christ. And so it, it is a tall order. It, Paul said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Uh, you step where I step. It's kind of like a sergeant walking through uh, a minefield he doesn't say, boys, go clear away for me. He walks through very carefully, knowing what he's looking for. And then he gets through the minefield and he, and he turns to the soldiers and he said, just simply walk in my footsteps. And Paul said, you follow me as long as I am stepping in the Lord's footsteps. There are several things that we do need to understand about the character or the nature of the way 
in which the Bible was written. It was written basically to a, a people that were illiterate. It was written so that it could be read to an audience. And Jesus is saying, as you're out in this world, you are a testimony, you're a light, you're a city, and that draws people to me. And so as we're talking about heaven and the citizenry of the kingdom, we are to be a people that have a certain character and characteristics. And this is what you find in the church at Corinth. Our Lord had so graciously blessed them with spiritual gifts, more than any that we read about. And in chapter 12 of the book of 1 Corinthians, they become haughty. They, they become um, puffed up and they become proud and they become arrogant and they treat people in a very condescending way. But even within the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God had given to the church at Corinth, there was an argument about which one of them is the greatest. And Paul is saying in chapter 12 and 13 that it, the more excellent way is what we ought to be following in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, 39. But then he goes on and he talks about the excellent way and then he deals with chapter 13. As he is dealing with, and he has to go into the negative. Love is, love is, love is, but love is not. And so apparently, reading from that, we realize that they were acting in a way that's not reflective of a definition that God would give of love. And so in chapter 13, here's what we find of Paul saying about love when he goes into the negative. He describes in chapter 12 and in verse 29 and 30, he talks about the excellent way. And he starts talking about and giving a definition of what love looks like. When you say to people, uh, do you love your wife? And uh, she's sitting there and she'll say, yes, I love her. I'll turn to the wife and I'll say, tell me how. It's a verb. It's an imperative. It's, it's a doing word. Love has certain manifestations. Well, he just loves me. That's not a definition. Love is. And this is what Paul deals with in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as he's trying to educate and transform a very arrogant church to what love truly is. And so he says there, and we've dealt with these in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 beginning, love is patient and love is kind. But now notice as he goes into the negatives, and we've dealt with these so far. Love does not envy, and it is not boastful. It's not a bragger. It doesn't feel like I've been robbed if someone else is more talented than I am. It is not arrogant and rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. And so what I want to do today is I want to deal with another two characteristics. Love is not arrogant, and love is not rude. And so here's what we find. <clears throat> A man who is so wrapped up in himself makes a mighty small package. Let me repeat that. A man wrapped up in himself makes a mighty small package. And so there are those there in Corinth, in the community of the cross, those that were leading the church have become very arrogant and they have become very rude. Sometimes when 
we graduate and we get our degrees, sometimes we become a self-absorbed people. Sometimes we have a tendency to look down on. At a graduation, the professor who was giving the graduation speech was warning the students to be humble. And I've been in congregations where Christians have gone to certain universities and they talk about, well, this Christian university is better than this Christian university. And they go on and on and on. And I just stopped them there in my office and I said, it is what you're going to make of it. And so many times when we get educated, we sometimes have this spirit of egotistic. And so the college professor was warning the students not to be arrogant and not to be rude and not to be condescending, but to treat all people like citizens of the kingdom. And at the graduation, he began to cut up a towel. And as he was cutting of the towel, he was talking about Jesus, the man who put on a towel, girded himself with a towel, and began to wash the disciples' feet. And as he was telling the story and relating the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, he was cutting up the towel. And the students began to wonder just exactly what his illustration was going to be. And so after he had cut up the towel, he would pass out the... Uh, the graduation, the degrees, and he would give each one of the graduate students a piece of the towel. And he says, put this in your billfold. Put it in your purse. Put it in your wallet. And it should be a constant reminder of Jesus, who said, if I, your Lord and Master, can wash your feet, can you not do the same? And so this is what Paul is basically having to do with the church at Corinth. They had become self-centered. They had become very arrogant and rude and were not showing the spirit of love that brings about unity, but they were divisive. Within that audience, you have an argument about which is the greatest gift. Within that audience, you have one prophet speaking above another. You had one that was speaking in a, a different language. And it's not babbling, it's delectus. It was a different dialect. And without an interpreter, you would walk in and you'd say, I don't know why he's talking like that. None of us understand. Uh, they must be mad. And yet they were doing this. And they were elevating one gift, one spiritual gift above another. To which Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 7, what do you have that you have not received? In other words, whatever spiritual gift they had, they had received it from the Lord. And that ought to keep us humble. And so we find that Paul, Paul said that he was of himself, he counted everything that he had attained in life, and he was without pedigree. The Bible says that he, he was above his peers. If he was a registered dog, he would, he would have the certificate. And he said uh, there in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 7, he said, I count all these things but loss for the knowledge of the excellency of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, no one could be elevated above Paul, but Paul surrendered. Paul submitted himself to the serving of the Lord, which meant he was serving the brethren. And he was taking the example of Jesus in John chapter 13. My Lord could get down on his knees. He could humble himself and he could wash the disciples' feet. So can I. And so the first point that I want to bring out here from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, is the idea that love is not arrogant. 
It's not the idea that I know so much more than anyone else. Amy Carmichael once says, those who think too much of themselves don't think enough. J.B. Phillips, in his translation, captured it this way. He said, love does not cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. You have those who were given spiritual gifts. First Corinthians chapter 4, all of our blessings come from above. And we ought to realize that. And Paul said, I surrender to the Lord. I'll take my piece of cloth and I will serve the Lord by being a servant to his people. And he contrasts that spirit, the spirit of the Lord, to the spirit in Luke 18 verse 11 of the self-righteous Pharisee who stood up here and, and folks looked to the Pharisee. They thought, if I'm going to make it, I've got to be like him. And here's a Pharisee standing there praying to the Lord. And his first words are, thank God that I am not like other men, like this beggarly man down here in the gutter. And that shows you the spirit of arrogance. Love is not arrogant. It does not treat people like trash. It treats people like citizens of the kingdom. Now remember that those that we are working with and those that we are daily ministering to are going to be the citizens in eternity. And so what we do now, how we treat them now, is so vitally important. And it was Jesus who, in the book of Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 11, he talks about this spirit of arrogance and he said, whoever is going to be the greatest in the kingdom is going to be the greatest servant. Brethren, it's hard to wash feet and to serve brethren and have a spirit of arrogance and to have a spirit that condescends and looks down on others. A good example of this is the illustration that we find in the book of 3 John. In the book of 3 John, you have a man who exemplifies what Paul is talking about when he talks about arrogance, the condescending, the elevating of himself above others. And there is a contrast there between Demetrius, who was a servant, and Diotrephes. Listen carefully in the book of 3 John, as Paul or as John writes about Diotrephes. He talks about Diotrephes having, notice carefully, he liked to be preeminent. He liked to put himself first. He does not acknowledge our authority. Now remember, this book has an author. The authority of the author is God himself as he inspired man. And any time we, we reject the author or what is said, we reject the authority. And so here's John saying, here's a man by the name of Diotrephes who loves to put himself first and he does not recognize our authority sent by God. Basically what you have in Diotrephes is an unbelieving believer. He calls himself a part of the kingdom of God. He calls himself a part of the church. But he refuses God's authority. And so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. 
And not content with that, he refuses to welcome brothers and also stops those who wants to put them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate that which is good. And so John is saying, his Diotrephes, he is a walking, living example of what you should not be and call it love. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, and the first characteristic there, there are six things that God hates, yea, seven of them are, notice carefully, an abomination. When God uses that word abomination, you better sit up and pay attention. There's something distinct about what he's going to say. The very first thing that God hates is a haughty look or haughty puffed up eyes for those who think more of themselves than they ought to. And so there's the example that is given by Paul to the church at Corinth. A great illustration of a walking, talking, arrogant person. The Bible calls him Diotrephes. But here's what we find. We find that love is humble and it is modest. Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 12 and in verse 3, Love thinks humbly and modestly about self and about others. It is not lifted up. It is humble. And so Paul gives the illustration to the church at Rome. He addresses the elders and tells them, you clothe yourself with all humility. 1 Peter 5 and in verse 5. And to the elders of Ephesus, when he met them on the island of Miletus, as they were departing and there was the crying, there was the hugging of necks, there were prayers because they didn't know when they were going to see each other. Paul tells the elders there in Acts 20 verse 19 that he had served the Lord of all humility. Our Lord is a humble servant of God the Father. And it got so bad that in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, when a letter is written to Paul and Paul says, there's division, and I partly believe it. There was a certain characteristic about the church at Corinth that allowed Paul to go and to think that they were arrogant and lifted up. And so love is not arrogant. Love behaves itself in humility and in modesty. C.S. Lewis was the great writer, a professor at both Cambridge and Oxford University in London. And he attended a small local congregation. Many of those in the congregation did not know that uh, he was a man worldwide in popularity. He treated everyone, and, and he would write, he would respond to people. Thousands of letters, even though the demand was so great on the life of C.S. Lewis. But he believed that it was God's will that he answers every single letter that he got. And that he would treat every letter as if that person was either a king or a queen. He never looked down on, he never condescend it. And so love is not. It is not arrogant. And the Bible says it is not rude. Two of the, the, the list there of those negatives because the church at Corinth was not acting in love. And the verb therefore, the word rude, it conveys an idea of acting disgracefully. And we in the church have people that act disgracefully, that are not a reflection. And so 
we now have the idea of the lack of love can be seen in the church at Corinth because of their rude behavior. As has already been stated, you'd have one who would prophesy and another one who would try to out um, prophesy him. You would have one talking over another. You would have a person speaking in a different language without an interpreter. And it was just mass confusion. We see that in some church meetings. We see the misbehavior of the brethren. But Paul brings out in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, when it talks about love is not arrogant and it's not rude. They had a problem there between the rich and the poor. And what they would do is when they were going to the Lord's Supper and they had that agape feast, they had that common meal, uh, they went before. It's like you sit at the back of the bus. You sit at the back of the pews. You stay in the other building until we get through eating our sumptuous food. Food that we bought. You know, I just had a cow slaughtered and I've got some nice ribeye steaks. And you expect me to share them with you? I mean, you went by the three-day-old bread store and you bought bread. You went then and got ten for a dollar Vienna sausages. And that's what you brought to the table. Well, you let me eat my steak first. And then you eat your wieners, but I'm not shearing. And this is a spirit of rudeness. Is when we exclude our brethren, there's no respect for conviction or the economic hardship that some people have. Brethren, everything, everything that Michael D. Rain has, has been given to me by the Lord. And it ought to be used to glorify the name of the Lord. And so Paul has to deal with not only the uh, arrogance, but their rude behavior towards each other. And it causes him great heartache. When God gave his great commission in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it is given all Christians a global mission. Churches ought to be involved in helping the local community. It ought to be praying and budgeting for other works outside of ourselves. Otherwise we become maintenance minded rather than mission minded. And brethren, when the church is here to take care of every need of every brethren, you might as well close the doors. You might as well go down to the gravestone and you ought to have a gravestone um, printed up because you're dying. When we will not reach outside of ourselves, we have begun the death process. Paul said, love is not rude. I was visiting a very dear preacher friend of mine down in Bryant, Texas, and he had written a book on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And while I was there, I heard him talking to the director of a certain school in Texas. And they asked him, would you come down and would you defend and tell us what you have written, why you have written it? And my dear friend said, I know that if I come, how I'm going to be treated. And he was promised by the director of that school at that lectureship, no, we will, not, we will not treat you like that. You will give your position and then we will ask another preacher who disagrees with you just to give his position. And he said, I will come under those conditions. The whole time I think he knew exactly how they would treat him. 
And so he goes down there and he gives his position. The other preacher gets up and he doesn't give his position. He gives a rebuttal. You never know what he believes, but you know that what he is saying, he is simply going against this particular man who was so kind and graceful. And at the end of it, they were closing and the man got up who was asked to go down and give his position. And he said, brethren, I came down here with the agreement that there would not be a rebuttal. I would give my position. He would give his position and people could make up their own mind. The man who was so kind and humble the man who, when he went down there, that preacher knew how they were going to treat him. It was just their character. And he was treated very, very rudely. And so Paul, as he is writing to the brethren at Corinth, is saying, choose the more excellent way. The way that is not filled with arrogance and rudeness but God defines it as love. We're in a trying time where our love is stretched. And brethren, we want to say that, that we love you. We're praying for you. We're praying for our brethren. We're praying for the world. And if there's something that we might do to help you, to help alleviate some of the back-breaking burdens that you're going through, if you'll go to our homepage... You can find all the information there at the Farmington Church of Christ. If you need prayers, we would be delighted to pray for you. We would be honored that we can pray with you and for you. Brethren, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God in love has given His Son. We in love respond to that gift by dying to ourselves in the watery grave of baptism, putting Him on and allowing Him to claim us as His own. If we can help you come to a better relationship with our Lord, we pray that you'd let us know and we would be honored to help you.